Today, I want to give you a gift. It's knowledge. But it's not just any knowledge. It's wisdom. And it's the best kind of wisdom. The kind that comes from experience. Today, I'm going to teach you some basic Unity coding concepts I wish I'd learned sooner. In C-sharp, classes are a data type that contain fields and methods. Fields are things like ints, floats, and booleans. Methods are code blocks that are executed when called, like the simple add method. In Unity, when you create a new script, a class is created in it by default that is named whatever you named your script. And now that that class has been brought into existence, you can declare it in other scripts and use the fields and methods that it contains. I remember when I was first going through Unity tutorials, there would be declarations of ints and strings and booleans, which made sense because I'd seen those a bunch already. But then there would be a declaration of something like enemy spawner, and I would always think to myself, where the heck did that come from? Well, now I know that it just means that there's a class called enemy spawner somewhere in another script, and that's what we're referencing. Inheritance allows you to create a class that will have the same fields and methods and such of a base class that it inherits from. This is useful so you don't have to rewrite a bunch of code for classes that will have a lot of similarity. For instance, if I create a class named Animal and give it a few fields and methods, then I create another class called Cat and have it inherit from the Animal class, Cat will automatically have the fields and methods of the Animal class. To have a class inherit from another class, use a colon right here in the declaration of the class, followed by the base class. In Unity, you actually use inheritance a lot. That's because every time you create a new script, the class that's created in that script will inherit from mono behavior by default. Mono behavior is the base class from which every Unity script derives. Classes derived from mono behavior can access all kinds of cool things like the start, update, and on collision enter methods. When you get a chance, it's worth looking up mono behavior in Unity's documentation. But what I think is useful to know is that because mono behavior is a Unity specific thing, it sometimes limits what we can do in the classes that inherit from it. For instance, you may start following some c -sharp tutorials that aren't specific to Unity. And in those tutorials, you will encounter something called constructors. Constructors are very useful things that allow us to set default values for our classes when they are created. But mono behavior doesn't allow the use of constructors. In the beginning, most of the classes in your script will probably inherit from mono behavior, but they don't have to inherit from it. It depends on what you're trying to do. The game loop is essentially the code that's executed during every frame of your game. So if your game is running at 60 frames per second, then the game loop will happen 60 times in that second. And if your game is running at 30 frames per second, the game loop will happen 30 times. The game loop is responsible for processing user input, such as listening for when a key is pressed. It updates the state of the game, such as calculating how far a game object should move when that key is pressed, and it renders the game on screen so the player can see what's happening. This is what Unity's game loop looks like. As you can see, there's a lot going on during every frame. Unity's game loop is definitely worth studying in detail, but the thing I wish I'd known sooner was that Unity will only execute code that is written within certain methods in the game loop, such as awake, start, and update. So if you write a method out here, you have to call it from inside of one of these methods. I think everyone has at some point tried to set the position of a game object like this. My game object dot transform dot position dot x equals 3f. And the compiler will throw an error like this cannot modify the return value of expression because it's not a variable. I've gotten frustrated so many times and thought I was just dumb or something because I couldn't set the position of a game object. But I'm here to let you know that if this is happening to you, don't feel bad. The reasons for why you can't set the position of a game object in this way are actually kind of complicated. It has to do with the fact that transforms are structs, which are value types and not reference types. So just remember that if you want to set the position of your game object, do it like this instead. 
Create a new Vector 3 and set the position of your game object to that new Vector 3. It works like a charm. This might sound really obvious, but I think the most important concept I wish I learned earlier in my programming journey is that things in code point to other things. When I first started out, I would look at the code in tutorials and books and feel so overwhelmed because I thought I was supposed to automatically know what everything meant. But that isn't really how coding works, because so many systems and variables and classes are defined by whoever wrote the code. What I eventually realized is that the real trick is being able to trace through the code and piece things together by following what the lines of code are pointing to. For example, let's open Visual Studio and look at a short script I wrote for an old project. This here is our class declaration. This class is called Pellet Spawner, and my guess is that it spawns some kind of pellets. Here we have a colon followed by mono behavior, which like I said before, means that this class is inheriting from the mono behavior class, so it has all the fields and methods found inside it. Next, we have a pellet named pellet. If we hover over the type here, we see that pellet is also a class. That means that pellet is a class created somewhere in another script. Yep, here it is. Pellet is a class found in the pellet script. It's the same thing for game grid and scene controller. They are both classes created and defined in other scripts. Now we have an array of vector 3s named spawn points to emit. If we hover over vector 3, we can see that it's a struct defined in the Unity engine namespace. And here we have an int named total pellets. Next, let's go to the start method. In it, we are calling a method named spawn pellets. My guess is that this method spawns pellets. Let's look at the definition of this method. We can control click on it or just scroll down to where it's found in the script. Okay, so the spawn pellets method takes the height and width of a grid found in the game grid class, loops through that grid, and instantiates a pellet at those points. Then it loops through our array named spawn points to emit and destroys the pellets at those positions. Okay, now let's look at the update function. In it, we are calling a method named check if last pellet eaten and handle during every frame. Let's look at the definition for that. It's right down here. This method checks to see if our total pellets gets below zero and starts a coroutine that calls a method in our scene controller class named pause game and load scene with delay, which takes our current scene plus one and uses it as a parameter. We can go look at that method by control clicking it. In the scene controller class, we find the method and see that it sets the time scale to zero, which will pause the game. It will wait for a specified number of seconds before it loads the scene at whatever index we pass to it, which in this case was our current scene plus one. Then it sets the time scale of the game back to one. Cool. So that's everything that's in our pellet spawner script. I hope reading through some code together and jumping around through some of the scripts was helpful. Okay, so that's it. Those are some basic Unity coding concepts I wish I'd learned sooner.